Çığır bir şey yok. Sorkin yok. Böyle Rövdan'ın falan sorusuz bulan Rövdan'ın kanıtıdır. Yani bu da Well, good morning to you once again. It is always good to be here with you folks. We do appreciate uh, the opportunity to stand in your pastor's pulpit. Uh, I know that he hates to be away. And when the uh, pastor's away, he likes to make sure he's got somebody here that's going to fill in for him. So I'm honored to be able to do that. I do appreciate your pastor. He's a great friend to me. And uh, does a great service to our college at Clear Creek by serving on the board of our trustees. Actually serves as our chairman. So I appreciate Brother Benny. And uh, it's an honor for me to be here and to fill in for him today. Uh, like, uh, I like to say to every church that I speak to, before I preach, I want to say thank you. Uh, especially to this church uh, for your financial support. You've been a long time supporter of Clear Creek. And uh, you enable us to fulfill the mission that God has given us. And that mission is to provide the training for those whom God has called to Christian service. And that's what we do. That's all we do. And if it wasn't for churches like Faith Baptist Church, we couldn't do what we do. So uh, I want to say thank you to you all uh, for your prayers and your uh, financial support. And uh, sharing your pastor with us as he uh, gives us wisdom and knowledge as he serves as the chairman of our board of trustees. So uh, we're thankful for all that God has called us to do. Thankful that you have partnered with us uh, to be a part of that. So thank you on behalf of all of us at Clear Creek. Uh, now I'm a preacher at heart, so let me share with you a message that God has uh, given me to share with you today. This message was born out of uh, an experience I had last week in one of our chapel services at Clear Creek. Um, we ha had a, a, a husband-wife team. I can't tell you their names because they served with an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. And uh, I don't know if you've got a computer at home or if you've got internet access anywhere. Let me encourage you. Uh, to go check out the webpage of Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, this was a very inspiring chapel for me and our students because what these uh, folks do, this husband and wife team and uh, other folks all over the world, they work with the persecuted church. Um, and uh, they, uh, they shared some experiences that they had had and uh, they continue to have and they showed some videos of uh, individuals that were uh, real life individuals who were part of the persecuted church overseas and it was some very moving stories about how folks were being persecuted because of their Christian faith and because of their dedication to uh, the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ and it just really challenged me about how uh, at ease we are in America. How we many times take for granted the blessings of just, I mean, folks just being able to carry around the Word of God. I mean, just to be able to uh, just carry it around with us, uh, put it in our cars and take it with us. And, and uh, this chapel message really inspired me because there was one story that stood out about this young man who was arrested for having a Bible. And he was given a two-year prison sentence just because he was a Christian and because a Bible was found to be in his possession. But that was not the whole story. When he got to prison and through the course of the time he had gained some... Um, uh, kind of confidence of the of the prison guards and all that and they would they would release him not release him but he was allowed to go out and gather firewood for the prison he was kind of a trustee you know what a trustee is and they would let him out to go out and he would he would gather some firewood and, and bring it back in well uh, throughout the course of that time after he had gained some of their confidence he would sneak off and some of his family would give him pages of the Bible to smuggle back into the prison so he could read during his time there. 
And he got caught. And his two-year sentence turned into a 15-year sentence just because he got caught with the Word of God, the Gospel in his possession. But what it was was his, his testimony of, of, of what the Gospel, what the Word of God meant to him. He said, when I got arrested, he said, I, I didn't think I'd be able to... I, I, he said, I couldn't survive without the Word of God. Without, without having the Word of God to read. I, I, I just didn't want to exist without having some scriptures, the gospel to read. Therefore, he took the risk. He took the risk of being caught with those smuggled copies of those Bibles that he would smuggle into the prison. And he ended up serving close to a 15-year pr uh, prison sentence for being a Christian, but then also for uh, breaking those the, the, the Word of God into the prison. But in his mind, it was all worth it. Because he said, the Gospel is my most prized possession. And he said, I, I know I couldn't exist without having the Word of God to read. And he said, that's why I went to the lengths that I did to make sure that I could have that uh, while I was there in prison. Now, I don't know about you folks, but that convicted me. I mean, that, that was not some uh, fictitious story. That was a true life personal testimony. Uh, I saw the man. I heard his words. And it began to uh, uh, instill, in, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit began to instill a challenge into my heart. And it begged a question. Uh, and it's simply, what is our most prized possession? When it boils down to it, what is our most prized possession? Folks, there are, there are people all over the world getting killed because of their Christian faith today. Today, there's a certain number of people that are getting killed because they refuse to renounce their Christianity. There are people all over the world today that are getting killed because they're found to have the Word of God in their possession. But for them, it's worth it because the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it is their most valuable possession. And I think that's a question that for the church in America, for me and for you, maybe that's a good question for us to ask ourselves. What is our most valued possession. Well, I want you to turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I want to use for a text this morning verses 8 through 14. And I want to uh, structure this text around that question that the Apostle Paul is addressing to a young man named Timothy. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, as we look at verses 8 through 14, Paul is trying to instill in this young man who he has mentored and bringing up in the faith, he's trying to instill in him the importance of the Gospel, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, and what that should mean to him in his ministry. Now there's a reason that Paul starts off his letter to Timothy uh, with these words. And I'll, I'll set that for you. But let me read this passage for you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 starting with verse 8. The Bible says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For thee which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And that good thing which was committed unto thee, meaning the gospel, that that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Now, these are some very emotional words that come from the Apostle Paul to a young man named Timothy who was just kind of getting started in his ministry. But here, Timothy was undergoing some persecution for his faith. He was trying to deal with some false teachers and and other things in the church where he was ministering. And there was probably some... uh, 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 feelings going through his life that, you know, what's the use? I, I want to quit. And, you know, uh, don't, don't we all get like that sometimes when it comes to whatever ministry God has called us to do? And, and, and Paul knew that Timothy was at a kind of a, a crossroads in his ministry. And, and, and Paul wrote this letter to this young man to remind him of how important his ministry was. Now, What's interesting is that Paul wrote this letter from a prison cell. Paul was in prison. And he was writing to this young minister to uh, encourage him. But notice in the text that I read for you this morning, Paul's great concern, even though he was writing from a prison cell, Paul's concern was not about himself. It was for Timothy. And not only for Timothy, but his concern was for the success of the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. You see, uh, Paul was encouraging him to be faithful in the ministry of the gospel. And he's, he's writing this letter to encourage him that the most important thing that you have in your ministry, the most important possession that you have a hold of for you to do the work that God has called you to do is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. And he's trying to remind Timothy that God has entrusted to you as He saved you and called you to ministry. You've been entrusted with the gospel. And don't let the circumstances that, that surrounded you now take you away from that. Be mindful of how important the gospel is to your ministry. So his final exhortation here to this young minister is is to focus on the gospel and the sound teaching that can be found in the gospel as God uses you to minister. So church, let me say to you today, as God convicted me as I heard uh, from the voice of the martyrs team and and how how important the gospel was to the ministry that they've been called to and how important the gospel was to these folks who were being killed because of it and in prison before it. Before it, they, those things were happening to them because they looked at the gospel as a treasure to them. The, the gospel was the most prized possession they had. And church, we need to realize today that everything that we do today is for the sake of the gospel. Amen. The good news of Jesus Christ. And we need a sense of urgency in what we are doing. So... What, what I want to do is walk you back through this text and, and let's, let's recall the mindset that Paul was trying to get in Timothy's life, that urgency about what he had in his possession. And how does that, that same sense of urgency, how does that come alive in our life today? Well, there's a couple of things that, that I, I, I think his words remind us of. Uh, when, when does God's Word become our most prized possession. Well, the first thing is, I think it it, it comes that way to us, first of all, when we see the gospel as a treasure, okay? Do you see the gospel, the Word of God, 
and all that it involves, do you see it as a treasure for your life? Look at verses 8 and 9 and 10 and notice that in these verses, as Paul encourages Timothy to realize what he has in his possession, he describes the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, as a treasure to him. And I call it a treasure because when you look at verses 8 through 10, he's describing what the gospel is. Notice uh, in verse 8, first of all, he says, Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. He's saying, don't you shun away one minute from the, the, the gospel and, and all that it brings to your ministry, even though it may be afflictions. And then he says, be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And then look at verse 9. He begins to explain why the gospel is this great treasure that we have in our possession. He says, according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Church, I would say to you today that we need to realize that the gospel is a treasure to us. First of all, because the gospel has the power to save. The gospel has the power to save. Notice he says, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling. The gospel is a treasure because it saves us and it saves others from eternal separation from God. That's a treasure. It saves us. Uh, to the church at Rome, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believes. It saves. The gospel is a treasure because it saves. So Paul's reminding Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't, don't flinch from any affliction that may come because of the gospel because, is, because the gospel comes to you through the power of God and it has the power to save. It saves people. It saved us as Christians from eternal separation from God. That's exactly what that word means. It, it saves us. Do you realize what a treasure the gospel is to us? The power of the gospel is this. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship that is able to take any person from where they are and bring them to where God wants them to be. That's what the gospel does. It is a forgiving, liberating, invigorating new life that Christ offers through the gospel. It's that great hymn of faith that we all know that declares amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's the transforming power of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and what He did on the cross. It has the ability to melt hearts. It has the ability to change lives. It has the ability to change attitudes. It has the ability to forgive the past and usher us into a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Church, we need to realize today that we have in our possession a most prized possession, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, because, and it, it should be a treasure to us because it has the power to save. It has the power to save. Right now, this morning, if you're here as a Christian, the gospel brought the power to save to your life. You have been saved from eternal separation from God. This morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the gospel can be your most prized possession because it offers you the hope of a future with God. Through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The gospel is a treasure because it has the power to save. But look down in verse 10. Notice a second thing that Paul says about the gospel. Not only should it be a treasure to us because it has the power to save. But in verse 10 he says the gospel should be a treasure to us 
Because it also has the power to give life. It has the power to give life. Notice he says uh, in verse 10, But is now made manifest, again he's talking about the gospel, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. How? Through the gospel. Through the gospel. He's saying the gospel should be our most prized possession because it has the power to save us and the gospel has the power to give life. Now, as I look back through that verse 10, there's a couple things I want you to see there. When he talks about the gospel has the power to give life, notice he says a couple things. The gospel has the power to give life right now to us. When we come to receive the gospel and we come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the gospel gives us life right now. John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus Himself said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus said that He came to bring purpose and meaning to life right now. Church, the gospel should be a treasure to us because when we receive the gospel, when it becomes a part of our lives, and then when we have the gospel to offer to others, we're offering new life, new purpose, and meaning, and hope for the world, just like it brought to our lives. There's hope with the gospel. You know, we've all experienced those long and hard winters where, you know, by the time the end of winter gets here, things are looking pretty dreary and, and you don't think spring's ever going to get here. We've been through those winters before. We know how that is. But what happens with the seasons? We know that spring does get here, doesn't it? And life begins to be restored. It's interesting to see how the seasons pass. And, and winter passes and spring gets here. Flowers will bloom and trees will bud and plants will grow. And it's just like that with the gospel. In the deepest, longest winters of our lives, deep below the surface, there has always been the promise of life from God. That's what the gospel is. God through Jesus offers hope in the midst of our despair. And the gospel should be a treasure to us because it offers us life right now. It brings life over and over and over again just like spring. You see, as dark as it may be for you right now, there's always hope when God's involved. There's always a light. There's always a, a glimmer of hope. There's always a glimmer of light when God is involved. And that's what Paul was saying, that the gospel is a treasure because it brings life. It brings hope. There's hope for you today. There's hope for your friends today that don't know Jesus Christ because the gospel brings life over and over again. But also look at the end of verse 10 there. There's a second thing I want you to see. Not only does the gospel has, have the power to give life right now, but here's the thing. The gospel is a treasure because it also has the power to give us eternal life. Notice what Paul says there at the last part of verse 10. Talking about Jesus Christ who has abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Through the gospel. You see, the gospel not only brings life now, over and over again, but it also brings us eternal life. Paul states here that Christ Jesus abolished death. Abolished death. Now think about that, church. We will all face death someday, but the promise of the gospel is that death is not an end to our relationship with Almighty God. That's the promise of eternal life. You see, death is just a journey to eternal life. Because he says there in the last part of verse 10, in Christ there is immortality. You know what that means? That means that we have an unending existence with God. That's a treasure. He says the gospel is a treasure because it not only brings life now as we live, but it brings us eternal life. You see, friends, think about this. 
Our relationship with God established through Jesus will never, ever, ever be severed. Never will it ever be severed. Our place in God's kingdom will never be erased. Our life will never end. It will change, but it will not end. The treasure of the gospel is rich enough to provide abundant life for us in this world and everlasting life in the next. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Keep on because you've got the most prized possession you could ever have. You've got the gospel. It has the power to save. It has the power to give life. Life right now and life eternal. You see, that's a treasure. That ought to be our most prized possession. But the question is, how valuable is this treasure to you? And that's the challenge of this passage. When you get to verses 11 through 14, that's what Paul challenges us with as he challenges Timothy. He's already laid out the fact that when the, the God's Word or the Gospel will be our most prized possession when we see it as for the treasure that it is, that it has the power to save, and that, has, that it has the power to give life. But then the challenge is, what will you do to guard it? Because notice what he says in verses 11 through 14. There, uh, Paul says uh, in verse 11, I've been appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And he says there in verse 12, I've, I've, I've suffered things because of that, just like Timothy was going through. But notice he says... Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says. He says, because I know whom I have believed in, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Talking about the gospel lived out in his life. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm committed, and I know that the one, in whom, the one whom I believe in is going to keep that which I've committed to. And there he says in verse 13, hold fast. To that sound form and that sound teaching that you've seen in me. And here's the, the foundation of the text here in verse 14. Notice what he says. And he points it back to him. He says, that good thing, meaning the gospel, which was committed unto you, he says, keep, keep it by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Now I want you to look at verse 14 there for just a minute because this is what I want to say to you. When God's Word becomes our most prized possession, when we see it for the treasure it is, Paul says, and then he says, once we see God's Word as our most prized possession, look at verse 14, he says, you will do. You need to do what you need to do to guard it and protect it your most prized possession. That's what he says in verse 14. He says, I charge you. We've been entrusted with the gospel and we're charged to guard this treasure. Now, I want you to look at a word there. In verse 14, there's a word, keep. He says, that good thing which was committed unto you, keep it. And I want you to circle that word or highlight that word, keep there. That word, keep, means to guard. It means to guard something. It means to preserve something or protect something. It means it's something that's been, that you've been entrusted with, that you've got in your possession, and you see it so valuable that you're going to do what you need to do to guard it, to protect it, to preserve it. And that's what he's saying there in verse 14. This good thing, the gospel which has been entrusted into your ministry, keep it, guard it, guard it. With all that you have. And remember, Timothy was being threatened by the false teachers and things that would be a hindrance to his ministry. And Paul said, guard it. Guard the gospel. Don't let anything hinder the, uh, the, the spreading of the gospel through your ministry and your life. And church, I would say to you, that same charge should be heard in our lives today. So too are we to guard against anything that would try to undercut the the truth of the gospel. 
in our lives. He said, guard it. Now notice also in verse 14, Paul reminds us here of the key factor in guarding the gospel. And you see it right there in, in verse 14. Keep that which was committed unto you. Keep it by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Paul reminds us that the key factor in guarding the gospel is simply the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. You see, we can't do this on our own, but we can claim the power of the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell within us the moment we come to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. And Paul quickly reminds Timothy here of his weakness and his inability to guard the treasure of the gospel all by himself. He's saying that strength and that wisdom that you need to guard the gospel, it will come from the Holy Spirit. Keep it. By the power of the Holy Spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, you think back in Jesus' ministry. Jesus said that to the disciples before He left them. And He left us the Scriptures that said the very same thing to us. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus said, I'm going to pray to the Father. And He will give you another comforter. That He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot see. And seeth Him not. Neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. And over in John chapter 16, Jesus expounded all that when he said, When the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that good thing, the gospel which has been entrusted to you, keep it, guard it, protect it by claiming the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. Paul says you don't do this on your own. You're not, you're not qualified. You're not able on your own. But you guard it by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. You see, these false teachers and those that were the enemies of, of the gospel in Timothy's ministry, they would do all that they could to undercut the gospel and to stop it from spreading. And Paul says, I charge you, if you see this as your most prized possession, keep it with all that you have. And I would say to us today, church, nor can we be much of a guard without the power of the Holy Spirit lived out in our lives. It's the power of the Spirit who will help us to, to guard and defend and preserve and protect the gospel. You see, there are those that we will encounter this week that will want to destroy the value of the gospel in our ministry. We must live our lives in the power of this gospel led by the Holy Spirit to protect this treasure. And you look back on the lives of men like Paul and, and, and Timothy and, and they lived their lives in such a way that they, they guarded this treasure. And I would say to you, with the help of the Holy Spirit, with your, with your commitment to the power of the Holy Spirit, we can guard this treasure in the same way. And I would say to you, as, I, uh, as we end our time in this text here this morning, what are some ways then that, that you can guard this gospel? Well, let me just, let me just give you some, some quick ways here. When, when he says... This good thing, keep it, guard it. How, how do you guard the gospel? Well, I think we guard the gospel by reading it and studying it every single day. I would say to you today, church, read, the, read God's Word to be transformed. Not just to read it. Read it to be transformed. We guard the gospel when we read it and we study it. The more we know it, the more we're able to defend it. I would say to you, we guard the gospel when we spread the gospel. Okay? When we spread the gospel, we can ensure that its influence is greatly multiplied. So I would say that we guard it by giving it away and, and spreading it and spreading it. Do we see the gospel as the valued possession that everyone needs that doesn't have it? Is that how you see the gospel? You see, we, we guard it by spreading it. And then lastly, I would say to you, we guard the gospel when you and I as Christians live it every day. When, when our talk, when what we profess and our lives match, when we walk with personal integrity as Christians, you and I, we're guarding the gospel. When my walk and my talk match, there's one thing that happens. Christ is honored. So we guard it 
by living it. You see, the problem is for us today, church, so often our, our, our lives make the gospel suspect. That's, that's the big thing against the church today. So, so often those don't match up. And too many times the lives of the church makes the gospel suspect. And I would say to you, when we fail to practice what we preach, we're not guarding the gospel. We're not guarding the treasure. So we guard the gospel by reading it and studying it. We guard the gospel by spreading it. And I would say to you, we guard the gospel by living it. By living it. Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 13 that He saw the gospel as a, the greatest treasure in life. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 and 46. He said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field which when a man has found it, he hideth, and for the joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. He said again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all he had and bought. So I would say to you today, the good news of the kingdom of God is like a treasure. It's the pearl worth any price to receive it. And I'm asking you today, as Paul said to Timothy, how valuable of a treasure is it to you? What are you doing to guard it from being devalued in your life today as a Christian? Maybe you're here this morning you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I would say to you the gospel is the most important thing you could respond to today. Maybe you're searching for hope and purpose and meaning in your life. I just read to you, I just explained to you what the gospel can mean to you today. It can bring you life. It can bring you new life. It can bring you purpose and meaning through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that's the gospel. That He loved you enough to die on the cross for your sinful life that you're living right now. And He rose from the dead that third day and lived today ready to offer you the free gift of salvation. That's the gospel. He loved you enough to do that for you. The question is, will you respond to that gift of love for you today? And will you bring that purpose and meaning into your life and let the gospel be a part of your life that can bring you life now and bring you life eternal? Whatever the need, whatever your need, there's no doubting the fact that the gospel is the most prized possession we could ever have. I hope it is for you this morning. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you so much for this word. Uh, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for what the gospel means to us today. And Father, I know there's a lot of believers here today, a lot of Christians. And Father, maybe there's some of us that would be willing to say, Father, I've just been at ease. I haven't... I haven't looked at the gospel as the most prized possession in my life and ministry. Maybe that's changed for a believer here today. Maybe someone would say, I need, I need to be on guard better in my life. I need to, I need to uh, be more watchful for things that are trying to devalue the gospel and its impact in my life. If that's the case, God, help us to see that and help us to make that change as a Christian this morning. I pray for someone here that's that's not a believer. And they're searching for purpose and meaning in their life today. And Father, maybe some of them would say, I recognize I'm a sinner this morning. I need a Savior. And I know that Savior is Jesus Christ. And I believe that He died on the cross for my sins. And that He rose from the dead that third day. And I believe He lives today as the one perfect sacrifice for my sins. And maybe someone would today would say, I, want, I need to confess Him as my Savior and Lord today. And I want to trust Him. I want to turn from my sins today. And trust Jesus Christ as my Savior today. I want the gospel to be a part of my life. Maybe that's the need this morning, Father. For someone that just simply needs salvation in their life. Whatever the need, God. Help us to see the gospel is here to take care of that need today in our lives. May we respond and make it our most valuable possession today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.